Our subject is the acting brain. Taken together, the parts of the central nervous system devoted to movement are known as the motor system. The motor system allows us to plan, coordinate, and execute every action that is needed to survive in the physical world. All of the movements that we make, from the breathing of our heart to the hitting of a tennis ball, are controlled by the brain and the nervous system. As the legendary biologist Charles Sherrington once said, to move things is all that mankind can do, and for this task, the sole executant is a muscle, whether it be a whispering of a syllable or felling a forest. The question is then, how does the brain do it? How does the brain translate subjective intentions into basic physical actions? What happens in the brain when we learn a new skill? Why are some of us graceful and others clumsy? Why does practice make perfect? Much like the visual system, the motor system is astounding in its complexity. It controls over 650 muscles, giving rise to an immense repertoire of movement and actions. Coordinating these muscles is a tremendous challenge, which the motor system carries out mostly without conscious instruction. Reflexes, for instance, allow us to respond immediately and unconsciously to changes in our environment. Other essential functions, such as breathing, are also performed automatically and unconsciously. But while some motor functions are innate, most of our physical abilities must be learned through practice. During infancy and childhood, we learn to crawl, walk, and use language. By the time we reach adulthood, these difficult tasks have become effortless. In fact, most of what the motor system does is taken for granted until it is interrupted by injury or disease. Every behavior is mediated through the motor systems, from the simplest to the most complex. Uh, all sensory perception, visual perception we discussed last time, reaches its completion through the actions of motor systems. In fact, we can think of the motor systems in some ways as being the mirror image of the sensory system. The sensory systems create a, a schema, an internal representation in our brain of the outside world. The motor system uses that internal representation in actions. And like the sensory systems, the motor system is localized to particular regions. And it has three important uh, components, a hierarchy, if you will, to decide to make an action, to pick up a glass of water, to mobilize the, mu uh, the muscles to actually make that movement, and then report back that that movement has been carried out successfully. Well, I think we have to ask a very fundamental question, perhaps the most fundamental question we can ever ask, and I think it's remiss that Eric hasn't asked it in his first um, show, <laughs> but why do we and other animals have brains? It's a yeah. pretty fundamental question because there are many species on our planet who don't have brains. So that's a fundamental question that we should all be taught on our first day of school. And if you think about that question for any length of time, it's obvious why we have a brain. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movement. There's no other reason to have evolved a brain. So if you think about it, the only way we can affect the outside world is through contractions of muscles. So if you think about communication, speech, gestures, sign language, writing, they're all mediated by contracting muscles. So we need to remember that things like sensory processing, the perceptual system, memory, and cognitive processes are all important, but they can only be important to drive action or suppress future actions. There's no point laying down memories of childhood or perceiving the color of a rose if it doesn't lead you to something different with your motor system later in life. Oh, but, wow. I, but I'd love to show you a video. Okay, please do. Okay, I'd like to show you a video really of what's cutting edge now in robotics and what's cutting edge now in human performance, just to give you a feel of, of how close we're getting. So if we could roll the video um, of the robot. What this video shows is an end of a three-year project by my colleagues in Germany, teaching a robot to pick up a glass and pour, pick up a, a jug of water and pour some water into a glass. And as you can see, it does the task, but clearly it's not doing it anywhere as fluidly or speedily as a human would do it. You would regard this as rather poor performance. So this is a very challenging task, and if you now want to train this robot to do something different, you'd be starting another three-year project. There's no generalization from one task to another. So this is a fundamentally very difficult problem. Let's compare that now to what we regard perhaps as the cutting-edge human performance. So what we're going to see is a small child, uh, I think a nine-year-old, winning the world record for cup stacking. Now, cup stacking is a popular sport in America. It involves taking, I think, 12 cups and stacking them and unstacking them in a particular sequence as fast as you can.
only one of those classes, the motor neuron, actually sends a process out of the central nervous system, out of the brain and spinal cord, to communicate with the periphery. So all of these dexterous tasks that Daniel showed you are really dependent on the activity of motor neurons. And if we have 600 muscle groups, we now know that in order to accommodate the combination of muscle activity, we need 600 motor neuron subtypes. So in a nutshell, the problem that the brain has to solve is how to initiate movement exactly when you want to move, how to control exactly which part of the body you want to move, and all of that information has to be funneled down into the spinal cord and activate just the right set of motor neurons in the right combination to produce coordinated movement. Now, is there a dramatic difference between a reflex action and a conscious action? Yes, so this is the other great insight that Sherrington had and comes to the third component of movement. There's no point in moving or acting if the brain and the central nervous system and the body doesn't get some reporting of the consequences of action. So Sherrington spent much of his life not only working on the way that the cortex interacts with the spinal cord, but the way that this information is fed back through reporting of the state of muscle contraction. So any coordinated movement, the cup stacking that we saw, requires the fact that the brain receives online information about the efficacy um, with which those motor tasks are performed. And that feedback information comes in through sets of sensory neurons that are acting as if you like a strain gauge is monitoring the intensity and the timing of muscle contraction and feeding that in the simplest reflex circuit back directly to form a single synaptic connection with the motor neuron. So this is an involuntary stretch reflex circuit, if you like. John has talked about the things where you have a desired behavior and you have to then generate the behavior. But there's a flip side which is very important in learning, and that's prediction. So control is about what I want to do, how do I generate the commands. But the other side you have to learn is how to predict. That is saying, given the commands I send out, can I predict what's going to happen? How do you do that? And we know, we know now a lot that the brain actually has a little internal simulator. So when I send a command out, I get feedback from my arm, from vision. That's governed by physics, the physics of my body and my sensory receptors. But we now know within the brain there's a little neural simulator which says, oh, I can see the command going out. Let me try to anticipate or predict what's going to happen. And so as I'm moving around the world actually doing things, I have this little simulator in my brain simulating what's happening and trying to anticipate it. Now, why would you want one, given you it's really going to happen? And there's several really good reasons to have that. One is you can, in theory, just sit here and then simulate movements to decide what the best one is. Yeah. But a really important one is one of the problems with movement is when I send a command out and get the feedback, there's about a quarter of a second delay between sending it out and getting the feedback due to delays in the system. That's a very long time if you want to play a fast tennis stroke. Right. So one of the ideas, rather than working on reality, you can work on your internal simulation, which is faster. And we can give you, John and I have a little demo we'd like to show you to prove <laughs> oh, to you this prediction. And what we've brought along is one of the heaviest books you can find in the library. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is written, this, by, this, written by, the, by Tom and uh, Eric. Uh, it's, it's the standard textbook in the field. Right. Right. Sean has a few chapters in there as well. So uh, this, this is called the waiter uh, task. It's, very it's, similar to, the, it's called the waiter task. Right. It's very similar to if a waiter brings you something on a tray, and you have a choice of whether you lift the thing off the tray or the waiter lifts it off the tray. But we'll, we'll do the waiter task. So, John, I want you to support this book. And now, he's the book. To do that, he's having to contract his muscles. And if I wait too, he might get tired if I wait too long. Normally, we wait. We like to have naive subjects, but John's naive enough for our, for our, <laughs> our case. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the book and ask him to keep his hand still. And if we can just watch what happens to his hand as I remove the book. So effectively, it's impossible to keep his hand st still, right. to anticipate the timing and to therefore relax the muscles. But if I ask John now to remove the book himself with his other hand, his brain will be predicting the consequences and he can do it without any motion at all. And this is something you can all try at home. It's impossible to learn to keep your hand still when someone else removes it because the brain is anticipating the actions of one part of its body on the other. It can do it perfectly. And this predictive mechanism even explains why we can't tickle ourselves. So we know that our actions affect the way we perceive sensory feedback. And the reason I can't tickle myself is because of this predictive mechanism. I predict what's going to happen in terms of sensory feedback, and therefore I'm not surprised by it. We, we, we suspect that there are many factors that contribute. Certainly in about 10% of cases, we know that there are mutant genes right. that make sick or toxic proteins that actually actively kill a neuron. 
But we also know that behavior probably plays a role. There's a, some data that soccer players in Italy, for example, have a higher than expected incidence of ALS. We know the head trauma may be a factor. Um, we know that the environment uh, may uh, it, it's also influence, of course, the disease, and there may be uh, just some role for uh, what we call stochastic events, bad luck. Right. This is such an important principle because what uh, Bob is showing here for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is almost a general principle in the nervous system. Most diseases, Parkinson's disease, they have multiple causes. Right. So one doesn't think of simply a single factor like genes. That is one way of producing the disease, but there are other ways of producing it also. Yeah. This idea that if we understand how the acting brain works and motor functions, it will be the key to unlocking well, <clears throat> other higher I forms of brain function? I think in the end it will. There may be people who disagree around the table, but I think... We can't study things like perception in the absence of understanding how it affects movement because effectively the way we use information is very important. And we don't do perception in isolation from action. So I think we can probably study perception and we'll know about perception, <coughs> but unless we can link that to the action, we won't have the whole picture. So in the end, we have to understand how the information is used. And therefore, once we solve motor control, we will have by definition have had to solve all the other things which feed into what, it. What has also emerged, and we referred to this early in looking at the hand of a basketball player shooting a basket, is that even when we don't engage in movements, our motor systems are simulating the movement. So there's a lot more movement going on in our brain than is visible to the outside uh, world. The point that we made on that is that some people have even said that thought is basically movement pl movement planning without the movement and so from an evolutionary standpoint you could imagine if we understood motor planning and simulation without the movement it's very likely that those planning processes were co-opted for higher level thought